going to be talking to you Kyle Um I was a gifted professor from the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering and Earth Science in the University of Vernon Dane. I always so uh, very conscious of how to pronounce his name. Um, I've been a bachelor's uh, from the uh, University of Memphis and uh, being a PhD at Arizona State University and did a one year postdoc with um, NSF SBIR project with a small company on nano based coding. That was really cool to hear. Uh, Kyle's research focused on really broadly physical chemical treatment processes of emerging contaminants, including um, uh, catalytic, sorptive, thermal, uh, uh, electrochemical uh, processes. Um, and also including understanding the transport of emerging contaminants with advanced analytical tools. We'll see how it integrates both the phase transport as well as the treatment side today. Um, and his recent work include emerging contaminants, including PFAS, which we'll hear today, and also macronate plastics. Um, he has won an uh, answer career award and also a provide scholar. And with that I'll turn the floor to yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me out. It's been quite lovely so far. Uh, I've only been to Minneapolis flying through. So first time actually stopping and staying and it's, uh, it's been nice. Um, yeah, so uh, today I want to talk about uh, incineration or thermal treatment of per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, also known as PFAS, which hopefully everybody has heard of these by now. If you haven't, I will give you a little bit of a brief introduction. Uh, just to catch you up. Um, and the idea here is that we want to use different additives in order to enhance the incineration process and make it uh, more feasible as a treatment process. I might have to wake up my clicker here. Okay, so what are PFAS? PFAS is a very, it's a growing, growing group of organic synthetic chemicals. Uh, you know, the last time I checked, it was 9,000. It's probably 10,000 now, more and more PFAS keep getting added to the definition and added to this database. So there are a lot of compounds that are considered PFAS. They've been produced worldwide uh, since the 1940s. Uh, and you might have heard them called forever chemicals in the news, which is a common term that's been used because of their inability to break down naturally. Although we now know this is not true for all the PFAS, more of the uh, for the original ones. Uh, so PFAS, uh, generally has been defined as a structure that looks like this, where you have an aliphatic tail that's composed of carbon and fluorine. And uh, this tail is going to be hydrophobic, oleophobic, uh, and it has these very strong carbon-fluorine bonds that are very difficult to break down. Okay? And on the other end here, you have a head group, which is hydrophilic, and this in itself makes it a fluorosurfactant. Okay? And because of this uh, all of these nice chemical structure properties, it's been used in a lot of different applications uh, that we'll see. So the original ones were uh, perfluorooctanoic acid and perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, also known as the C8s, so PFO and PFOS. Uh, now, these are no longer manufactured in the, in the U.S. and in Europe, but they are manufactured in other countries, and we do get products from those other countries that will contain these. So there's still a feed into the U.S., uh, that have PFO and PFOS, and these are both considered carcinogens. Okay, so it's a little bit scary from that standpoint. Uh, here's what the structures look like. The difference between these is the head group. So PFOA, the octanoics, are, uh, they have carboxylic acids as a head group, and the PFOS has a sulfonic acid as the head group. Okay? Um, so the thing about PFAS and the chemical companies that manufacture them, like DuPont, is they have an unlimited number of PFAS that they can choose from. So sure, PFO and PFOS aren't met anymore, but guess what? They have a whole array of other PFAS that they've replaced them with, uh, uh, as shown here in the green box. Okay, so you have like PFHXS, and all this is is you're taking PFOS and you're shortening the chain by two carbons. Okay, so it's a, it's a very similar compound. PFBS is four carbons. Uh, this HFPODA is something called Gen X, which you may have heard of in the news. This is the one that has heavily contaminated Cape Fear, in the state of North Carolina because that's where it's manufactured. Um, I love bringing this bag with me because first of all, it's my favorite bag. This is a Tom Ben bag. So if anybody knows what Tom Ben is, it's a very good bag manufacturer. This thing is coated in Gen X, but I can't get rid of it. It was like 300 bucks. I, I refuse to get rid of it. It's so practical. Uh, but yeah, so they have a, what's called a durable water repellent coating on it. And that's composed of Gen X, right? It used to be co composed of PFOA. 
as composed of Gen X. And all they've done here is they've taken uh, PFHXA and they put an ether group in the middle. Okay, now uh, those two are banned. This one's banned. So let's just make that one instead. And as you can imagine, now we're seeing all types of toxicity, toxicity issues with Gen X. Uh, so over 97% of the population has PFAS in their blood from its ubiquitous use. Um, it's been connected to all types of health issues. Cancer is obviously the number one thing that we're concerned about, but you also have decreased fertility, uh, increased blood pressure and cholesterol, developmental delays, et cetera. There's a whole slew of things that it's been connected to, and it is uh, compound dependent. So what kind of products? Honestly, you name it, it probably either has PFAS in it or it's touched PFAS at some point. And I'm not joking there. Um, consumer products are just heavily, it's heavily used in consumer products. You might've seen the recent news uh, about the FDA was going to finally ban PFAS use in food packaging at food containers, et cetera. And then uh, in the, I think it's the fifth district federal court uh, shot it down. So that's the one that's uh, in infamous. It's very conservative. It shoots down a lot of environmental uh, uh, things that come through it. Um, one of the major uses of PFAS, though, is what, is what we'll focus on today is aqueous film forming foams or AFFFs. Uh, so these are used uh, to put out these nasty fires that are caused by gasoline, oil, et cetera. So the heavy users of this is the military, okay? so the Department of Defense, and airports, and then your local firefighters will also have a storage of AFFF for putting out like uh, when a tanker truck spills over, et cetera. Um, unfortunately for us, or the military, uh, they've been having firefighter training exercises since the 1950s usually weekly, sometimes every two weeks, where they get out and they do this right here, where they just spray kilograms of this very concentrated AFFF foam that's loaded with PFAS onto a firefighter training ground, usually a concrete pad. Uh, so they set a fire, they do the training, and then that's it, okay? And this has been happening for so long that I would say probably every single Department of Defense uh, installation has contamination. So let's take a look at a few sites. When I say a few, I obviously am under-exaggerating here. So as of August 2023, there are about 3,200 confirmed locations that have PFAS, whether it's in the water or soil, et cetera. Uh, there's approximately 60,000 presumed contaminated sites, okay? When I say presumed, it's because we know that PFAS is in wastewater treatment plants, nearly every wastewater treatment plant, and we know that they discharge into a stream, for example, so that stream's gonna be contaminated. Um, we know military sites are contaminated. We know there's a lot of industrial facilities that use PFAS, so those are likely to be contaminated. So a lot of dots. Uh, we'll try to break it down here. This was a study from, I forget when it was. I had the citation, but I think it was last year. Uh, so these are industrial facilities that use PFAS. Okay, so they're, they're known industry that uses PFAS in this process. So it could be contaminating the area. These are major airports. Uh, these are all your military installations, and these are your wastewater treatment plants. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on today, because this is where I get my funding from, is the military installations. So there are over 700 known military installations that are contaminated with PFAS, and it is a huge problem. So we're not talking about nanogram per liter levels. We're talking about microgram, milligram per liter levels. Uh, to put it into some context, the drinking water regulations that are coming out are nanogram per liter. Okay, part per trillion for six PFAS have been proposed. It should have come out by now. I don't know why it's not out, but this year we should have our drinking water regulations for six of those PFAS. Um, and then this map here gives you a rough idea of the contamination of drinking water systems, so municipalities. So at least 45% of the nation's drinking water contains PFAS, which is a little scary when you think about carcinogens, the MCLG is zero meaning that we should not be exposed to any of this stuff. Um, and it's, it's from a cost standpoint, it's going to be pretty astronomical uh, how much it's going to cost us. Okay, so I want to think about the other end, though, the solid waste that we're creating. Okay, so you have drinking water treatment. You're going to use activated carbon or ion exchange resin, or you could use reverse osmosis, and you're going to create wastes. Okay, you have all of the soil that's contaminated. You have pavements that are heavily contaminated, and you have all of the leftover AFFFs, right? So AFFFs, with PFAS aren't used anymore, they're being banned. Okay, so I think it's this year that officially the DOD is not allowed to have any of this stuff. 
okay? What are they gonna do with it all? This is heavily concentrated, 3%, okay? That's 30 grams per liter approximately of concentration in these AFFF solutions. And then you have all the firefighter trucks, et cetera, that were storing this stuff. that have to be cleaned out and you create this rinse aid waste. So what do we do with all of this? Well, the EPA and the DOD have been working together to create interim guidance on how we destroy all of these solid waste that are contaminated. And right now, um, incineration has been proposed as potentially the best now technology for handling all these wastes. Okay, you could also put it in a landfill, but think about that. I mean, you might just be creating a future problem. Okay, you're just throwing it in the ground, and then you're gonna have to treat the leachate one day. I mean, it's not going away. It's not gonna break down biologically. Uh, so typically in a hazardous waste incinerator, okay, you have two processes. You have uh, what I'm gonna call a primary stage and then a secondary stage, which is also known as afterburner. So typically in a primary stage, you put in your waste here. So this would be this rotary kiln. You heat it up to 800 degrees Celsius in air. Um, what that typically is doing though is not destroying, in the case of PFAS, the PFAS, usually desorbing it from the solid waste or the liquid waste. And that goes into a high temperature uh, afterburner where you're treating it at roughly anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 degrees Celsius. So very high temperatures. And then it goes through a lot of uh, air pollution control measures. And the, the big question is, is, well, first of all, is the waste treated at those temperatures? And then are we forming anything that's harmful? Um, this is crazy looking, and I did this on purpose. Not to sit here and just give you like the, this, you know, go through all these processes, but this is a smidgen of the possible degradation pathways that occur during incineration, okay? It's extremely complex, especially when you think about all the different types of PFAS that you can start with and the different types of processes that you can go through. Okay, so you can, you can cleave the head group, uh, that forms a radical, the radical can react with F that's hanging around, it could react with OH, it could react with H, et cetera. Okay, those will further degrade. And then the big thing here to focus on is what comes out the end here. So this little gray box here. So you have radicals that can form. This is C2, F4, uh, this is CF4, et cetera. This is the problem, okay, with incineration. You form what's called products of incomplete destruction, PIDs, okay? Um, this is the current list. So this, this list just came out this year. This is what's called an, uh, an other test method. So the EPA releases, this is how they determine what we should be testing in the flue gas. Okay, so this is a list of, I think, 30 compounds, a lot of different compounds that you have to, to measure for using gas chromatography uh, triple quad, right? So kind of an advanced technique. And the problem here though is you see 30, that's what we know, uh, there's probably a thousand, right? How are we gonna capture all of these? And so that's one thing we like to think about is these are great to know, but what about all the others? Um, so because of all of these PIDs that are formed, right? Depending on your temperature, the residence time, how much mixing you have, like these big systems are imperfect, okay? It's not like you're always gonna see 800 degrees Celsius or 1200 degrees Celsius in that afterburner. You have cool zones, you have incomplete mixing sometimes, and you, you, you produce these PIDs. What you would like is to do what's called complete mineralization and defluorinate it all, form CO2 and HF, hydrofluoric acid. That's what you would hope, right? And then the HF gets scrubbed out and forms fluoride, okay? Um, but because of these PIDs, uh, there's actually a temporary halt on incineration of all solid waste by the DOD. So they have these stockpiles of PFAS waste just sitting around accumulating and they have no way to treat it. Okay? And this halt is gonna happen until we figure this part out, PID part. Uh, so our goal uh, in our research is to reduce the temperature required because 1200 degrees Celsius is expensive. And also to eliminate the formation of those PIDs. How can we do this? So the first thing that we, we want to do in our, uh, with our research objective is to develop a total fluorine method. So this goes back to when I showed you all these compounds, all these different pathways, could be all this starting stuff there, there could be intermediates, and it's really hard to track everything. So if we have a total fluorine method that can follow the mass balance in an incinerator, then we can, we can get down to the problem of where uh, the PIDs might be forming. And then the next thing is we want to look at a low cost additive to not only reduce the temperature, but stop the formation of PIDs. Okay, so fluorine mass balance, where are we at here? You start with the PFAS waste, you have PFOS, PFOA, uh, A2FTS is a replacement for PFOS and AFFS, and they could have a bunch of unknowns that we don't even know about. 
that are in these AFFFs, okay, all these byproducts. Goes into an incinerator at the two temperatures we talked about. And then you're going to have some leftover product that could have PFAS in it still. It could react with other stuff, form calcium fluoride, sodium fluoride, et cetera. Uh, the flue gas goes into a wet scrubber where you're going to capture HF and some shorter chain PFAS. You may capture some of the more soluble gases. And then what comes out of the flue gas are things like CF4, C2F4, C2F6, et cetera. So these are these insoluble, like really volatile, low boiling point uh, products. So what we kind of specialize, specialize at is analytics. Okay, so we, do, we, we are kind of known for total fluorine, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But then we also have access to all the targeted analyses that we would need to, for example, track that whole list. Okay, so we have uh, liquid chromatography, triple quad, and then also GC triple quad. And then what I'm going to talk about today, though, is PIGI, which is an accelerator. So particle-induced gamma ray emission spectroscopy or spectrometry, if we're measuring things. And then combustion ion chromatography. Has anybody in here used the CIC before? Just curious. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit about CIC and what I hate about it. I love to, I love to bag on CIC wherever I go. Um, so the challenge is with total fluorine, though, is, is it's not like I can just go analyze my sample and everything's working out. That would be awesome. Uh, the, the biggest problem is how do I separate inorganic fluorine? Okay, so I have this remaining matrix. Let's say it's the ash product. Okay, it's going to have potentially some inorganic fluorine. And it could also have your remaining organic fluorine that's in there. And if you do something like PIGI or CIC, you're going to capture everything. It's total fluorine. So you have to separate those two. And for something like soils, that's really challenging where the background fluorine is extremely high. Uh, all techniques have pretty poor detection limits when it comes to total fluorine. And then there's a lack of standard methods, i.e. zero standard methods. And then there's also a lack of standards. You have to kind of come up with your own standards. It's not like you can go by and uh, you know, a mass spec isotopically labeled standard that you can use. Okay, so let's talk about PIGI. So PIGI is unique. We're one of only, I think, three universities in the world that have this. The other university in the U.S. was uh, built by the same guy that built this one. So he was at Hope College. He built one there, and then he came to Notre Dame, and he, he built one at Notre Dame. Uh, well, I guess, uh, let me correct that. There are PIGIs elsewhere, but not doing PFAS research. Uh, so what it is, you have a Van de Graaff accelerator that makes a proton beam. Okay, the, the proton beam, we have this wheel here that we can load our samples on. It's a solid phase analysis. Okay, so uh, if you have liquids, you got to put it on a solid phase. If you want to analyze it, use a piggy. Um, so the proton beam will hit your sample here. So you can see the little baggies here. That's about what the beam looks like, beam size. Uh, it accelerates the nucleus, okay, or sorry, excites the nucleus. Uh, releases a gamma ray that has a fluorine characteristic peak that we can measure. Um, the width is about six to eight millimeters, and then the penetration depth, so it's not a true surface technique, is about 100 microns. So there's a question I get a lot. Well, how deep does it go? Um, and does that matter? Yes, it does matter, and it actually makes it pretty difficult to standardize things. Uh, what we have found, uh, and this is kind of the nice thing about total fluorine, is it doesn't matter if our sample is loaded with PFOS or PFOA. We can use sodium fluoride. Whatever the fluorine uh, standard is, is irrelevant because we will get approximately the same standard curve for when we're standardizing things. So this is really nice if, for example, we're doing granular activated carbon. I don't have to create a bunch of standards with PFOS, which can be expensive. Okay? It's also tedious. I can just use sodium fluoride to create the standards. And then I can measure the total PFAS content in a bunch of GACs. Uh, and, and this is... a uh, very nice because it takes about one to two minutes per sample. So we can just crank through samples, okay? Keep that in mind when we talk about CIC, which takes like 30 minutes a sample. Or if you're doing fluorine NMR, that takes uh, hours to do one sample, All right? So it's a very rapid screening type technique. Um, you guys doing fluorine NMR? Oh, sorry. You can, you can, send, me, you can send me some piggy samples. Um, so again, I said, if you, if you want to do liquids, you got to load it onto a solid. So Graham Peasley, uh, this is out of his, his lab here. It's the nuclear physics lab. Um, what he's shown is that if you use, uh, for example, in this case, an activated carbon felt, you can just connect that to like a two liter bottle cap, drill a hole, let the water pass through, and then you can get uh, a concentration factor into the PPT range. Okay. It's two liters of water though. So detection limit's not that great, but if you have enough sample, you can make the detection limit as low as you need. 
Um, he's actually, so I focus more on the solid phase side, treatment side. He's really focused on the health base side and drinking water. So he's got a startup company now where they're doing a spinoff. They're making piggies on the bench top and all this stuff. Um, okay, let's talk about combustion ion chromatography. This one is commercially available. There's two, two places that sell it, Metrome and Thermo. It's basically, it's basically an incinerator. Okay, your sample goes into a, a combustion oven. You heat it at over 900 degrees Celsius under excess water and oxygen. You form HF. The HF gets turned into fluoride. The fluoride is then quantified with an IC. Okay? Um, it's also being proposed as the method for EPA's uh, draft method 1621 for measuring total fluorine in drinking water samples. Uh, we have a CIC, and I hate it. I hate the CIC. It has worked uh, maybe one week out of every two months, and then it breaks. It's down for two months, and then it works for like a week, and it's down. I won't tell you which brand we have. Um, detection limits. So I would say um, fundamentally the detection limits of the CIC are better than the piggy just because of the way the system works. So you can get ground, down to about nanogram of F uh, mass in your sample. And this is kind of what the solid samples look like before and after you put them in the CIC. Uh, for liquids, you need to do either a concentration factor if you want to get down to nanograms, just like Piggy, um, or you'd have to do something like a blowdown or SP or something. Okay, so we talked about flooring background and that can be problematic. I don't show the soil one here, but this is a log scale. If the soil one was here, it's like up in the ceiling. Okay, so background fluorine in soils is extremely high. So if you think about it, if you have micrograms or milligrams of fluorine and you're trying to measure nanograms of PFAS, the difference there alone is gonna be lost in the, let's call it the noise of the instrumental method, okay? Uh, but for resins, so this is resins on the left here, and this is GAC, again, this is log scale. We can analyze those with no problem. Okay, so the question we wanted to ask was, okay, well, how good is the CIC, right? If I put in a microgram of F of PFOS, do I give back a microgram out, right? And that's what this figure shows here. So this is the recovery of one microgram of PFOS that was spiked into resins on the left here, and then granular activated carbons on the right. And as you can see, uh, for most of the resins, it's kind of hit or miss on if we get good recovery. Um, and this is mostly due to the way resins combust. So when resin combusts and it's incomplete, it forms organic acids, and those organic acids tend to interfere with the fluoride peak on IC. So that's a little bit problematic, but we've, we've found a, a few ways around this now. GAC, we get pretty good recovery of what we spiked, but again, it's not perfect, okay? Um, and then there's this interesting one down here. So this is a Hydrodarko B GAC, and we got almost no fluorine back um, when we did our analyses. Uh, so I don't show you the data here, but what we found is that this sample has a lot of calcium in it, okay? And uh, when calcium reacts with HF, you form calcium fluoride. And calcium fluoride is a very thermally stable compound. So if you're using a combustion ion chromatography, you're not gonna see it. Okay, so if you have soils, if you have samples, et cetera, that have calcium or magnesium, you're probably not going to get your recovery, and you may think that you don't have any total PFAS in your sample. Okay, so it's limited. Yeah. Uh, it's just instrument variability. Yeah. Well, in this case, so in this case, the organic acids are interfering with the peak of the fluoride, so you get a bigger area than it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then this is just yeah, just instrument variability. You can see the error bar there, pretty significant. Uh, so advantages: uh, CIC is commercially available. You have a pretty good detection limit. Um, uh, for both liquids and solids. Piggy is rapid, uh, it's non-destructive. The recovery is not affected by background matrix, right? So if there's calcium there, it doesn't matter. Um, we could get PPT with some preparation on Piggy. Disadvantages, this is a big one for us, long analysis time. Um, the quartz tube that's used is like four grand. Right? It only lasts uh, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 samples, if you're lucky. If you're doing a lot of like high calcium samples, it'll actually crack, break, and you may only get 100 samples out of it. So that's, that's something they don't tell you when you buy it. Um, piggy, a little bit higher detection limit than what we'd like, and it's uh, not commercially available, right? So if you want to do Piggy, you got to send me samples, basically. Okay, let's talk about treatment here. Um, so going back to the second objective, we wanted to see if we could use additives to reduce the temperature required to completely destroy EFAS.
So what we did is we loaded, uh, in this case, we're using granular activated carbon as our solid waste. Okay, so granular activated carbon, we loaded it a lot. The two and a half milligrams of fluorine of PFOS per gram of GAC. We have this uh, pretty cool, what I call a bench scale rotary furnace. So kind of a bench scale hazardous waste incinerator for that first portion. So not the afterburner, but that first portion. And we tested uh, several conditions. So we did temperature, uh, we did treatment time, different types of additives, the ratio of additives. So the stoichiometric ratio, uh, uh, for example, calcium to fluorine. And then we looked at different gas types that we used to, to, to flow through the reactor. And then here's our baseline experiments that we varied everything off of. So 800 degrees Celsius, we treated it for 15 minutes. Calcium hydroxide was the additive that we focused on. And that was uh, taken mostly from what we've seen in the literature. So we saw some, some, some good news about that in the literature. So we, we, we selected that as our baseline, a one-to-one -one ratio, and then combustion instead of pyrolysis, so air. So uh, with regards to mass balance, the setup here, we'll try to break this down. Um, so for the initial phase, okay, so our GAC that we loaded, we used targeted analysis to figure out exactly how much PFOS was there. And we also used PIGI to make sure that the total fluorine amount matched what we thought we loaded on it. Uh, in the furnace, uh, the ash product or the solid fraction that we collected out of the furnace, again, we did the same thing. We used LC triple quad to look at specific species, and then we use piggy for total fluorine. Um, in our wet scrubbers here, so this is gonna collect that soluble gas, we use LC triple quad, we use IC, and then we use CIC, because that was easier to do the liquid phase, because you can do it directly to look for PFAS, okay? The one that you're missing here though, you're like, well, what about that other blue gas portion, the question mark, why didn't we do that? Well, we didn't do that, it's because OTM50, that long list I showed you, wasn't out yet. When we did this these experiments so that's kind of like a phase two that we'll do um and then when you see results here you're going to see it plotted as this alpha f which is the mass of either pfos inorganic fluorine hf or organic fluorine as a function of the starting fluorine mass okay so for example if 20 percent was pfos ash that means 20 percent of pfos remained after treatment in the solid so only 80 percent was removed Okay, um, let's take a look at the first results. So this is a, the, the testing the different additives. So all these alkali and alkali earth metal additives that we tested. So calcium hydroxide, calcium chloride plus sodium hydroxide. This was to test to see if it was hydroxide or the metal that was playing a, a major role. Um, we have uh, hydroxyapatite, we have magnesium hydroxide, all the way down to, uh, this was a control. All right, so no metal, and then we have no additive here. So I'll go through briefly what the bars are. The green bar is the inorganic fluorine that remained in the solid product. The purple bar is HF. The orange is PFOS that remained. And then the yellow is any of the organic fluorine that was captured in the impingers. Right? And if there's something missing toward the dotted line, the assumption is, is that it went out in that flue gas and we didn't capture it. Yes, please. So uh, it's organic fluorine and the ash is organic. Mm -hmm. You know it's not PFOS, but. How do I know the inorganic fluorine is inorganic out of the total fluorine went out, right? You measure PFOS, yep. and then you measure total fluorine. And so how do you know that that total fluorine we do, is inorganic? Good question. Well, we do an extraction. So you do a ammonium hydroxide methanol extraction to get rid of any of the organic fluorine that's there. There is an asterisk there though. If for example, you formed a radical during the treatment and that radical reacted with the activated carbon and then formed you know, something else where it's actually bonded to it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that, you wouldn't see it. But I have some other evidence that it's calcium fluoride or sodium fluoride, I'll show you. It's a great question though. Yeah, good question. Um, so as a reminder, uh, we're at 800 degrees Celsius here for 15 minutes. And then our variable we're, we're testing here is the different additives. Um, so at less than 500 degrees Celsius, okay, all of these hydroxides will form the oxide form. So calcium hydroxide forms calcium oxide, et cetera, plus water. Okay, that's a key thing to note, plus water. Okay. Um, so, all right, maybe it wasn't a surprise. Calcium hydroxide worked the best. Right? We want green bars. We don't want purple bars. We don't want yellow bars. And we certainly don't want blank bars, no bars. Right? We would like it all to remain in the ash. 
HF maybe as a backup option, uh, but still, if you do HF, you have to treat HF on the back end. If you can make it all stay in the ash, that's what you want, okay? Um, we didn't see any really nano effects. Uh, interestingly, if you look at calcium chloride, you're missing a lot here, so you're forming a bunch of very low boiling point byproducts. And if you just mix that with sodium hydroxide, you actually get better behavior than sodium hydroxide, okay? Um, Magnesium hydroxide, uh, surprisingly, I thought it would work maybe similar to calcium hydroxide. So what this tells me is that there's certainly a calcium benefit here. There's something about calcium that is making this process work more efficiently. Okay, so we'll dive into that a little bit. So what we decided was, okay, we looked at all these, um, you know, with no additive, you're not even doing full treatment. So we definitely want to use additives. There's something about the water that's released that is really beneficial. So if you compare these two, Okay, so we decided to stick with calcium hydroxide and test some of these other variables that I mentioned. Okay, so the first one was temperature. So without any additive, okay, so we have 300 up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, um, up to 400, you don't get any removal of PFAS, not even via volatilization, which is kind of wild when you think about it. I mean, you're at 400 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes and it's just staying, it's staying on the GAC. Um, as you increase temperature, you slowly start to see more PFOS being removed, more HF being formed. And then what you'll see here in the next graph is you actually see this decreasing. Okay, so this would be an, a PID, an incomplete destruction product. Um, so we get roughly 10 to 30% missing in this point in this box here. So these would be those very low boiling point PIDs. Now the magic happens, right, when you add calcium hydroxide. So at the roughly the same temperature, you start to see PFOS degrading uh, into HF and then this green bar, which we'll talk about here uh, in a second. And it doesn't matter what the temperature is, you get roughly the same results. So what that tells me is that at this treatment time of 15 minutes, um, I've reduced the need to go up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is kind of a well-known temperature that you need for destruction, down to 500. So I've decreased it by two. All right? it's, actually, it's actually better than that, and we'll, we'll see that here in the next next uh slides here so this this is just a very sorry it's a cheesy graph i, I shouldn't even fit it with an equation it's just very empirical um but <laughs> this is this is the ratio of hf gas to of gas so it's looking at the ratio of the formation of these purple bars to the yellow bars and all this is to say is that as you increase the temperature there's some intermediate reaction that we don't know what it is yet where you're seeing an improvement in the mineralization so whatever reaction is causing the PID to form, as you increase temperature, it's, you get this side reaction where you're getting more HF. So whatever it is, maybe it's an intermediate that requires higher temperature. Um, okay, so how about treatment time? That was for 15 minutes. What about treatment time? Uh, so I apologize here, I know it's kind of annoying. Without calcium hydroxide, we did it at 500. I hate that we did this, but it goes back to the whole baseline thing. Um, and with calcium hydroxide, we did it at 800. But for the, the sake of discussion, I think this is okay. So remember back to the graph I showed where we had a lot of PFAS remaining at 500. The question I wanted to know was, was well, it really a temperature thing or is it just time? Right? Are we at a barrier where we need more temperature or we just need more time? And this suggests to me that 500 is actually good enough, but you need a really long time, right? This is an hour. So you can see PFAS remaining in the ash going down. You can see more HF forming. Okay. Now, the difference is, though, if you treated it at 1,000, you probably wouldn't have as much of this yellow bar there. All right. So lower temperature, sure, long enough, you're going to get destruction or removal of the PFOS from the waste, but you may not get the byproducts you want. And then for the calcium hydroxide, we tested as low as five minutes, and we still saw the same behavior. In fact, what you don't see here is we've now tested for 30 seconds, and we still see the same results. So you can go as low as 30 seconds is as quick as we can go, like switching things in and out of the tube furnace. Um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, how about ratio? Right, it goes back to this idea, is it stoichiometric? Do I need one calcium for every fluorine that atom that's there? Um, so below one, so 0.5 would be the stoichiometric ratio if this was a stoichiometric reaction. Okay, I emphasize that because as I'll talk about here in a second, I don't think it's stoichiometric. I think it's catalytic, okay? Um, so if it was uh, stoichiometric here uh, at 0.5, you see that we don't get the complete mineralization that we want. As long as we have at least one, we get pretty good results. 
And if you go over four, you get almost 98% recovery of all the fluorine, okay? Um, so what are we forming though? Is it calcium fluoride? So we did some XPS, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. The top graph here is pure calcium fluoride salt. So this is the calcium window of XPS. So you can see peaks related to calcium fluoride. This is the fluorine window. Without calcium hydroxide, that remaining ash material, we see nothing and no peaks, okay? And then with calcium hydroxide, we see the exact same peak positions and peak ratios that we would with the pure calcium fluoride. So this is strongly suggesting that what we are forming is mostly calcium fluoride as our byproduct and it remains in the ash. So if you think about what's happening, you are, what I'm gonna call for the hypothesis of uh, what we think is happening, we are catalyzing the reaction. Uh, although the, the temperature itself, as we'll see, was not decreased for the initiation of destruction, okay, the, the rate was increased, right? We can do it in 30 seconds versus the hours that it would take. Okay, so you have an increased rate. Um, and then the second benefit is you don't have to scrub HF on the back end, which is a huge cost savings, okay? Having to deal with HF because you're just forming calcium fluoride. Make sure I got enough time here. What time are we, we done? Perfect, okay. Um, okay, so if it's calcium fluoride, what I'm calling full mineralization, or the addition of what everything is that, everything that adds into the mineral, mineralized component would be HF plus calcium fluoride. Okay, so if you add just those two things together and you look at it at different temperatures, you can see here's without calcium hydroxide, this is the mineralization efficiency, goes up to about 70% as we increase temperature. All right, so even at 1,000, we're only at like 70%. Whereas with calcium hydroxide, we get right at 425 degrees Celsius, we get this, uh, 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 increased mineralization, and then what is that, 500? We're almost at our max mineralization. So it initiates at the same temperature, okay? But we're actually getting higher mineralization. This is why I say it can happen at a lower temperature, even though technically the destruction happens at the same temperature. If you're a catalyst person, you, you would know why I say that, because you might make the argument that it's not a catalyst because it still happens at the same temperature. Uh, so two things about a catalyst, right? Typically you want it to lower the activation energy for the reaction to, to occur, and then you want it to be reusable. Okay, so if you guys looked at my reaction here, would you say it's reusable? Is the catalyst reusable? So that's the biggest argument against this. Um, we'll look at that here in a second, yeah. Okay, so what about the missing F? What are we gonna do? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is that OTM50 that I showed you, that list. Uh, but we also want to develop total fluorine methods because it only captures a fraction of what could be produced. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is online FTIR. Okay, so this will capture all the carbon fluorine uh, species. And we've already started some of this and we see some pretty good results here. I'm not going to really go into it though. That's the first thing we want to do. The second thing we want to do is try to capture that gas on a solid phase medium. So we've had decent luck with GAC. The problem though is when you get to really small stuff like uh, CF4. So this is uh, day one after capturing. So that's counts, piggy counts, 12,000. This is day six. This is day 20. So you go, you measure it with piggy, you wait 10 days, you measure it again, you wait 10 days, you measure it again, and it's just coming off of the solid phase capture medium. So we need a better capture phase medium, and I have some ideas. GAC is just not a very good one. Uh, so that's kind of our goal going forward is to try to capture that flue gas and then use a, a, a total fluorine method. Um, I'll probably skip through these. I thought it'd be interesting to, to show, but a lot of people ask, you know, can you reuse the GAC after you treat it? Short answer is yes, you can. And then from an LCA pers perspective, what's better? No additive, additive, regenerate, just throw it away. Well, as you might guess, I wouldn't show it to you if it was, <laughs> if it was not this, but uh, the lowest environmental impact is regeneration with the additive. And it's pretty significantly lower. So it's these yellow bars. What about other PFAS? Okay, PFAS is just one. Can we do others? Uh, short answer is so far, yes. We haven't seen any that we've tested that don't have a similar behavior to PFAS. Okay, so that's good news. That was actually a big concern. We didn't think maybe we'd be able to do carboxylic acids. Um, how about pavements? We talked about pavements. Can we do pavements? Well, what's the number one ingredient in pavement? Calcium hydroxide once you form the concrete. Okay, so it's inherently has the catalyst. 
as you might guess, uh, without pavement is the gray. So this would be our GAC. And this is with pavement up here, the blue. And this is just with calcium hydroxide. So we actually see a better reactivity with pavement. And that could be maybe because the calcium hydroxide to F ratio in pavement is like 80 to 1. So maybe that's why we see better behavior. Um, and then we see some interesting results with the, with the different PFOS. I think what I'll focus on here, though, is so this is no calcium hydroxide. This is with calcium hydroxide for three different PFAS. And you will see that different PFAS initiate at different temperatures, but the temperature that the destruction starts is the exact same with or without calcium hydroxide. And to me, this is a little, you know, from a catalyst person, I would expect the rate's faster, so the activation energy is lower. I would expect the temperature to be lower. So what could be causing the initiation to happen at the same temperature? My guess, I don't want to call it a hypothesis yet, maybe it is, is that the first step is not catalytic. The first step is thermolytic. And I had to throw in some mechanisms here before I, before I got you out of here. Um, so let's say you start with PFOS. PFOS, here's the tail, here's the head group. Sulfonic acid is a strong leaving group. So you're going to attack that carbon first thermolytically. That's with a little uh, triangle here, the theta. Okay, so you're going to cut off the head group. You form a radical. And it's my hypothesis that the radical reacts with uh, one of these oxygen vacancies on calcium oxide. And that's where the catalytic magic happens. You defluorinate, okay? And then once you defluorinate, the radical that you form from that actually then reacts with the O2 oxidized site that you have, okay? That and then forms a carbocation. The carbocation reacts with water. This is maybe where the water's coming in, the importance of water. That forms this OH uh, head group on this, and then you get HF, and that just continues down the line, okay? And then here's why I argue it's still catalytic. Yes, it's not reusable, but it's because it's being poisoned. HF is poisoning calcium oxide. You form the HF, and then the HF is simply just reacting with your catalyst and poisoning it, forming calcium chloride. Uh, and this continues down the tail of the, so you defluorinate and break apart the carbon bonds as you move down. All right, so we hope to prove this catalytic mechanism in the future. Uh, key takeaways, I always put the slide in, but I think, I think you guys understand the key takeaways. Calcium hydroxide is awesome. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's very cost effective. It's already used in practice at incinerators. Um, it's already used to stabilize biosolids. So biosolids is another huge PFAS problem. And those are typically pyrolyzed if you're going to treat them incinerated. Uh, well, not typically, but it's an option. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone in the audience. And then uh, postdoc and then a few PhD students. And then all of the funding for this comes from startup projects that we have. I hope I didn't go over time. Okay. I want to go all the way back to one of your early slides because that's where you lost me. <laughs> and, and you made a big deal out of the military, yeah. et cetera. My big concern right now is the solid waste coming out of uh, wastewater treatment. Yes. We no longer can put on farmland because of PFAS. Um, but it's 50% water or 80% water, depending on et cetera. How is this going to help? So in the, the incineration process, uh, biosolids are typically dewatered before they go. Well, not every, not every facility, but many facilities have a dewatering step. Or you could add a dewatering step. But that drops it down to 20 or 30 years. Right. Um, but it's also uh, potentially that water doesn't matter. Yeah. So we're, the next step we have here is we're actually going to be testing liquid waste. We just add calcium hydroxide to the liquid waste. Yeah. I remember the uh, one of the sludge treatment step is also adding calcium hydroxide. Yeah, that's the uh, stabilizing agent. Stabilizing yeah. to yeah. kill pathogens and increase temperatures and everything. Right. So yeah. that would be beneficial. Yeah. Hi, I was a uh, great talk. I was really interested in your your last mechanism slide. The early work done out of um, no i should have shown that <laughs> i'm just kidding the early work done out of scott mabry's group 
showed that once you once you get rid of that first flooring, you get an unzipping. Correct. Yeah, that's that's this piece down here. Okay. Yeah. So, but but you're showing steps in between that that still require the calcium oxide. So you you think you still need the calcium oxide for that further unzipping? Uh, I think that it's just an alternative catalytic pathway. Yeah, I think thermolytically you will still get the same unzipping process, uh, but it requires more energy. Uh, not only for this compounds, but take these away and think of the intermediates. So I think the intermediates are there's a catalytic role for those as well. Uh, I don't think the first step is catalytic. So I think the, the catalytic part is definitely coming somewhere in the intermediate process. I wish I knew. I think it's going to be difficult to do as well. I mean, if you do like density functional theory or something, it's very complex. And um, yeah, a lot of calculations involved. Um, so I guess in your lab work, it seems like you might be generating a lot of PFAS laden solid waste. What do you do with it? <laughs> <laughs> We generate a lot of PFAS waste. Um, great question. Uh, most of the solid waste goes through the incinerator. Uh, liquid waste, we actually have a, I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's like eight by eight, this big spill pad with drums that we just fill up constantly. And then um, I'm not really sure what they do with those. I have been curious though, what they do with those. I would guess they send them to a has waste incinerator. That's my guess. Yeah, they probably mix it do mixed waste disposal. Um, I have a question uh, going off the, I guess, but what about other PFAS question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you think that this like fundamentally similar mechanism would apply to different PFAS chemistries. And kind of related, if you've tested this in mixtures of PFAS or just with single chemicals. Thanks. So far, we've just tested with single chemicals, although I know that um, we have some AFFF contaminated GAC from Willow Grove in Pennsylvania. And uh, Charbel tested it, I think, this week. So I don't have that data yet, but my biggest concern there is not the mixture. I'm not worried about the mixture, it's the other stuff. That's an AFFF that might interfere. That, that would be my concern there. With regards to short chains, my biggest concern for short chains is volatilization before destruction, before it has a chance to react with calcium hydroxide. It just thermally desorbs and then moves on. It's like ultra short chains. Was that both your questions? Did I answer both the questions? Um, yeah, and then this mechanism, do you think that the same one could apply to other PFAS? Um, mm, I don't, this, yeah. Is this mechanism going to be easier for a short chain if they stay? Short chains will be more difficult, potentially. Uh, carboxylic acids, I think, are more challenging. Um, I don't think it's the same mechanism for carboxylic acids. That's just a guess. Yeah. So... I have one question. This is like when you're testing different types of additives, uh, why are you not trying out different silicates? Because that's a really large compound in different biomass, also in solid, also in like, like just soil. Um, do you think it would be important or is, is it, it does not that react? So I don't know much about silicates, but yeah, no, it's a great question. So the the reactor itself is quartz, so it's silica. The boat that you put it in is quartz, and uh, we actually lose a lot of HF because it reacts with the quartz and forms uh, silicon fluoride, tetrafluoride, SiF4. Um, whether it's uh, a catalyst, if you add the solid phase, uh, we have tested a few zeolites that are composed of silica, and we didn't see any reactivity. Uh, aluminum oxide is another option. So there's actually several different other what I'm going to call catalyst now, catalytic options that we want to explore. So this is kind of like the initial stuff, try to figure out mechanisms of how it works and then maybe try to develop a new catalyst that's better. Although I don't know if anything's better just because it's so cheap. Um, so I'd say probably no to silica, but maybe aluminum oxide has potential. Kyle, great talk. Um, so I have a question about PFAS concentration. Mm. So 
you've been working with really high concentrations and you had mentioned that you're not sure how this would work if you had other interferences. So if you're thinking about wastewater sludge, you're going to have a whole lot of other stuff in there and pretty low concentrations. Pretty low concentrations, yeah. And then the same with uh, drinking water, GAC, if you're starting to think about other kinds of absorptive medias. And so um, what do you... Do you think it will function the same way if you have low concentrations of PFAS? What is your specific concern about the other compounds that might be interfering and how do you think that would affect it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't have as much concern about concentration other than from an analytical standpoint. The reason we do the high concentrations is so that we can track the fluorine. Um, you know, it's it's not like a chemical reaction that's second order dependent or something like hydroxyl radicals. So I'm not quite as concerned about that, but I am, I'm concerned about the interference, I guess, more from a byproduct standpoint. I still think you're going to destroy PFOS, for example, but the intermediate radicals might react with whatever else is there and form something that, you know, I have no idea what it is. We may not be able to track it. So that would be my concern with increasing complexity. I'm curious, uh, what do we do with the calcium fluoride? Um, well, it's benign. So you could just take the ash waste and put it in a landfill if you had to. So the the the, the solid waste that is treated, you could put it in a landfill. Uh, we're currently testing to see if it impacts reuse of the GAC with water treatment. You have a bunch of calcium fluoride now as part of the GAC structure. So we'll see what that does. So the regeneration on your LCA slide was- That was without calcium hydroxide. So the breakthrough curves that we showed where you could reuse GAC, that was just thermal regeneration with and without PFOS. In fact, it got better. The GAC performance got better after thermal regeneration, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. And I was just curious, how, how did we find calcium oxides as, as a really good to start with? So there was a, a paper in like 2017 that, uh, so going back to your comment about they already used lime to stabilize uh, sludge waste. They were testing incineration for sludge waste with lime. And they saw that hey, calcium hydroxide is different than if we didn't have calcium hydroxide. That's where the idea came from, yeah. So kind of serendipitously. I was just wondering what kind of control or I guess like extra steps you have to take to ensure that the PFAS in your results is not coming from your equipment or like other laboratory apparatuses that you use. Ah, good question. This goes back to a uh, similar question about concentration. If there's cross-contamination, it's usually pretty small. So if we use really high concentrations, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> uh, but typically what you have to do, in uh, it was a lot of growing pains when we first started PFAS work, is you have to make sure you're washing everything with a certain solution to remove all of the, especially if you have like stock solutions stored in like a glass bottle or something. Uh, you got to get rid of all your Teflon tubing. Can't use any PTFE, can't use any, any, any sort of fluorinated tubing, any sort of fluorinated containers. You got to be really careful with like Nalgene type containers because some of them are... Um, they call chemically resistant containers, and that chemical resistance is actually a fluorine coating. So stuff like that, you just, yeah, you gotta, I mean, one was uh, we were using super glue to, to glue together some solids in order to run it on Piggy. It was like a powder, we wanted to make it a solid. Well, we found out that like 90% of super glues have fluorine. So we had to find like a fluorine-free super glue. So stuff like that, yeah. PFAS, it's not as bad as micro nanoplastics though. We do that in my lab too. That's way worse. I mean, everything. We we can't even use nano pure, ultra pure water because it's loaded with nanoplastics. So we have we have our own like old school water distillation setup that we make for all of our plastic work. So plastic's way worse. We should invite Kyle again to speak about nanoplastic. I know. I, I, I should I do plastics? Should I do plastics? Yeah. Too. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm curious, the, the PEGI technology you mentioned, the penetration depth is 100 micron. So do you have to deal with homogeneity of how you load the sample? How do you deal with that? 
Yes. I was hoping nobody was going to ask that. No. Uh, so the biggest issue, I don't want to call it issue, challenge with Piggy is that because it is a surface technique and there is some depth of penetration, the, your standards have to be pretty close to what your samples are. And you have to make your standards close to how the sample was contaminated. So, for example, GAC, uh, we take GAC and then we soak it in uh, batches of PFAS in order to create the standards. Yeah, but in real samples, there might be spatial heterogeneity. Yeah. Then you have, how do you cut the sample right now? On, or uh, we would do what? How do, you, how do you make your sample that's mounted on the sample holder right now? It uh, depends on what it is, but you just put it in a little Ziploc bag. It's that easy. You just, if it's GAC, you just put it in the Ziploc bag and you put it up on the... So most of the things we've done in the past are homogenous. Mm -hmm. Soils is really difficult um, for the inorganic background, but also the heterogeneity. That's why we haven't really messed with soils yet. <laughs> but we can do pavements. You take the pavement. That's, that's hetero... Yeah, that's, I mean, there's aggregates in there and stuff, though. We just grind it up and then you put it in the bag and we got a very good standard curve for pavements. I guess also if your technology, if Peggy is so fast, you can just mix it with different ways and then take multiple measurements and flip around it. Yeah, we triplicate front and front of the bag, back, back of the bag. Yeah. And mix it again yep. and remeasure it. Yep. That'll be doable too. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, thank Kyle. you. Thank you.